Hello, this is Annette Rabel from the University of Kentucky. Today's lecture will discuss the principles of anesthesia for neurovascular disease and other special circumstances in uh, neurosurgery. For this lecture, I will assume that you have reviewed the previous podcasts on neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuromonitoring, and the basics of neuroanesthesia. So in this presentation, we focus on carotid and arterectomy, approach to cerebral aneurysms, craniotomy for AVM, approach to a more broadly um, diffuse uh, cerebral vascular disease as it would be for Moya Moya, and also we discuss the awake craniotomy. So to start off with the carotid endarterectomy, this procedure is indicated in patients who either have symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, carotid stenosis, and we're doing this to prevent stroke or, you know, restroke. The indication says that uh, if the carotid ar artery stenosis is symptomatic, and your um, internal carotid artery diameter is more than 50%, or if a patient is asymptomatic and the diameter is more than 60%. Those guidelines are obviously in flux um, and uh, depending on patient's comorbidity. To address a carotid uh, stenotis, uh, stenosis, uh, we obviously have two options. We can do an open carotid endarterectomy or interventionally a carotid stenting. The benefits for an open approach would be the overall lower incidence of postoperative stroke and restenosis. However, you have the risk of anesthesia and with an open approach, you also have a higher risk of cardiac events and cranial nerve function. The risk for cranial nerve function with an open carotid and arterectomy is approximately like reported less than 10%, more in the range of 4%. In the dysfunction, we see uh, you know, maybe vagal nerve-related, uh, superior laryngeal and recurrent laryngeal uh, nerve dysfunction have been described, uh, which is then causing uh, hoarseness postoperatively. Or the other cranial nerve can be the hypoglossal nerve. Also, that has been reported. To give you an idea from how, uh, what, what the prognosis is if cranial nerve uh, dysfunction uh, is related to open carotid endarterectomy, one out of seven uh, reports appear to be uh, more long acting to permanent. So it's not a trivial complication of that open surgery. The advantages of a stenting, obviously, the more minimal anesthesia requirements, most of those cases are done on the MAC, and obviously a much lower risk of cranial nerve injury, since it's not an open technique, it's an internal technique. So the open carotid and arterectomy uh, in the operating room can be performed either with an awake patient implementing regional anesthesia or using general anesthesia. Neither technique has shown superiority over the other. Looking at outcomes and overall uh, perioperative risk. For an awake carotid uh, and arterectomy, the regional anesthesia needed is a superficial and plus minus a deep cervical plexus block, which covers the dermatomes of C2 to C4. The patient needs to be cooperative and tolerating the supine position with minimal motion for approximately one to two hours. The advantage of keeping the patient awake, obviously you have a direct monitor of neurological status so you can use a little bit of perioperative sedation. However, 
patient should always be able to follow commands and obviously maintaining airway. Also, additional benefits to the WIC uh, anesthesia technique as a better hemodynamic control, less bleeding, and overall a, sh a shorter length of stay for patients to stay in the hospital. They still have to stay uh, for a surgical de defined uh, period of time um, due to the possibility of post-op complications, um, but uh, reported less than as uh, reported with general anesthesia. If uh, patients receive general anesthesia for carotid endarterectomy, usually it's done using endotracheal tube uh, for controlled ventilation. Advantages of this technique are obviously a motionless patient. Uh, Hydrogenically, we can keep this patient eucapnic uh, and no provide normal ventilation. However, uh, as reported in studies investigating this, uh, those patients need more medications for hemodynamic support, and also you will need to use neuromonitoring since we uh, still need to uh, uh, monitor uh, cerebral function uh, during in a carotid endarterectomy. Which brings me to the next point, monitoring. If the patient is awake, we surely can monitor brain function that way. If not, here are your modalities which have been discussed further in your neuromonitoring module. Uh, but briefly here, the techniques used, either the EEG or evoked potentials in a combination of SSEP and MEPs. Um, also, carotid stump pressure has been reported to be used um, as a monitor for cerebral circulation. And then other indirect or more direct monitors of cerebral circulation are the cerebral oximetry and the transcranial dopplers. EEG and evoke potentials here, motor evoke potentials more sensitive than the sensatory, some other sensatory evoke potentials, are very ischemia sensitive and also indicate regional changes of cerebral blood flow. The carotid stump pressure, um, the way how it's done is that you measure the pressure in the uh, internal carotid artery after cross clamp placement, and you place that uh, pressure monitor in the cranial portion, so above the cross clamp. The pressure measures reflects the competency of the circle of villous collateral flow. Target is to keep the perfusion pressure above 50 millimeter mercuries. It's more or less a historical way how to monitor uh, cerebral perfusion. Uh, it is, has been seen as unreliable and really an inadequate technique because it's not very sensitive in a predictor of regional cerebral low perfusion states. A better way are transcranial dopplers. It requires a technician who can perform that technique, but since the MCA through the uh, transtemporal window is the easiest to examine uh, interoperatively, and the MCA velocity uh, does reflect the uh, uh, the MCA velocity on transcranial doppler does reflect cerebral blood flow because it's a direct extension of the ICA into the MCA. The MCA collects about 50 to 60 percent of the ICA flow. To avoid the requirement of a technician in the operating room present to perform a transcranial doppler uh, measurement, the cerebral oximetry um, may be an elegant way to go around it. Cerebral oximetry are sensors placed on the forehead, it's a bedside monitor, and we're using the brain tissue oxygenation as a surrogate for your uh, cerebral blood flow. The shortcoming here is obviously um, we are not monitoring the regional blood flow since the sensors are placed frontal and not temporal. Um, but you do get uh, a hemo 
sphere related uh, measurements or left versus right. Vantages, as stated previously, can be interpreted by the anesthesia provider, anesthesiologist. You don't need to have an additional technician in the operating room. So to summarize, no gold standards. You can make it more work uh, force elaborate with a technician either for EEG, uh, evoke potentials or TCD monitoring um, or uh, have a bedside monitor, uh, the cerebral oximetry. Uh, you have to monitor the, neuro, uh, the neurofunction, uh, the modality obviously is system uh, dependent. So what do we set up in the operating room? What are the anesthesia requirements? You do need invasive blood pressure monitoring. Um, arterial line placement uh, is very much gold standard. Where? Depends on your patient and uh, the comorbidities and what access you have. Not only blood pressure, but also you want to monitor your ABGs. If the patient is uh, asleep during the surgery, thrive for eucapnea, keep the patient normal ventilated, since hypocapnia relates, um, translates into vasoconstriction and therefore cerebral blood flow decrease, hypercapnia, the opposite vasodilation, increase in cerebral blood flow and the possibility of vasodilation in normal tissue, but due to uh, the lack of autoregulation in ischemia tissue, the diameter there will unchange causing a steel phenomenon that vasodilation in normal tissue uh, funnels blood flow away from the ischemic tissue or from the penumbra, something you do not want. Therefore, we avoid uh, hypercapnia as well. So the stages of your surgical procedure, uh, there is a preclamp stage, uh, the dissection. You maintain blood pressure at baseline you keep your CO2 in the range of 35 to 40 millimeter mercury. Uh, you want to maintain normoxia, keep your saturation above 96%, since also low lack of oxygen can also increase your cerebral blood flow. The optimal FI2 has not been established for this procedure. And also be aware of that before cross placement, your surgeon will ask you for heparinization. Therefore, you need to check your ACT and before and after heparin. During cross clamp stage, um, and that's depicted here in that uh, little graph, you have your uh, common carotid artery clamp and you have your internal carotid artery clamp and here's your external also. That flow needs to be disrupted, um, give or take where your plaque will be removed. Um, after clamp placement, uh, you want to ensure that the circulation to collateral flow, the circular villus um, provides sufficient circulation to your brain and all brain regions. So that's where normal monitoring comes into play. If there's an indication that there's a low perfusion state, you know, be prepared to augment the collateral flow with vasopressors and IV fluid. During that stage, uh, since uh, very close to where your surgeon will uh, manipulate and remove the plaque, um, the manipulation of baroreceptors can induce bradycardia and hypotension. After the plaque is removed and your uh, carotid artery is uh, closed, uh, sutured up, the cross clamps will be removed. And now in the post reperfusion stage, you may see in time of hyperemia, the post uh, circulation may have lost the ability to autoregulate, so therefore may be more vulnerable to a pressure-dependent uh, cerebral blood flow. So hypertension a little bit, but you want to keep it within range, so be prepared to counteract uh, the hypertension. There may be actually persistent hypertension, not only uh, due to the lack of autoregulation, but also due to the denervation of your carotid uh, baroreceptors. In addition, the plaque has been removed, but there may be small areas um, who at that point also can uh, get mobilized and causing cerebral embolization. 
uh, depending on how long your blood flow was disrupted and how well your anticoagulation worked, um, your, there also may be a thrombi development in your internal carotid artery, and so therefore after removal of the cross clamp, um, no restablishment of flow. At all times of uh, post-operative period, whenever you uh, open up a major blood vessel with uh, high blood flow and high pressures, uh, there's a change, uh, that there's a possibility for post-operative development of neck hematoma, uh, and that is well uh, documented to be capable of creating respiratory distress and respiratory compromise. Moving on to the next surgical field of uh, cerebral vascular disease, the cerebral aneurysm. Very commonly, we don't necessarily take patients of uh, cerebral aneurysm um, with known or uh, naive uh, cerebral aneurysm. We most of the time see them after subarachnoid hemorrhage, which are mostly caused by cerebral aneurysm. The severity is graded by the Hunt and has scale, Fisher scale, and then also the uh, World Federation of Neurological Surgery grading scale, the WFNS scale. What's depicted here is the Hunt has clinical classification because it allows us to very quickly communi communicate um, where our patient is at. Unruptured zero, one, two are the you know, minor um, uh, SIHs, and then three, four, obviously, patient is significantly compromised. The World Federation of Neurological Surgeon grading scale follows a similar approach. One is a GCS of 15 with no motor deficit. Two would be a GCS of 13, 14, also no motor deficit. Grade three, that's when a patient has a motor deficit in GCS still 13, 14, grade four, here GCS drops significantly, seven to 12, and yes, also plus minus motor deficit, um, versus grade five, that is when GCS is three to six, significantly compromised comatose, um, and plus minus motor deficit. The Fisher scale actually uses uh, radiographic images, uh, the CT scan, to grade your subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, one means no blood seen. Two, there's a very small, less than one millimeter thick layer, a diffuse layer of blood. In a fissure three, you have localized clot or an, an, a, a thicker layer of blood more than one millimeter. In four, fissure four, that means when you have intracerebral or intraventricular blood present. Aneurysms are not only graded by severity, but also by localization. They can be in the anterior circulation, as here as an ACOM aneurysm. They can be in the MCA, here as uh, aneurysm, or ICA aneurysm. Or they can be in the posterior circulation, here as a PCOM, um, PCOM or a posterior cerebral artery aneurysm or at the basal artery. So they can be at all branches of the uh, circle of villus, and it's important to know which location your aneurysm has because that correlates to your symptoms from a phasic motor deficit or as uh, commonly seen with the ACOMs, more behavior related changes. So, for cerebral aneurysm care, you know, we need to know what the symptomology is of our patients. Commonly described, headache, worst headache of my life, then acute mental status changes, focal neurologic deficit, all this obviously depends on the location of your aneurysm, and based on the location, but also severity of bleed, coma and death, sudden uh, death, also can be just related to aneurysm and to aneurysm-related complication, very commonly the cardiac complications. So the complications we worry about in patients with sub hemorrhages, obviously the re-bleed, the one bleed, creating the symptoms, and then the mobility mortality definitely closely relates 
to the occursion and time frame of rebleed. Uh, there can be sudden deterioration due to the abrupt increase in intracranial pressure, the intracranial hypertension, and to the occurrence of cardiac complications, which also very closely can be linked to the uh, to the amount of uh, uh, subaural hemorrhage uh, and the related sympathetic stress. So arrhythmia, myocardial ischemia, uh, sympathetic stress, and therefore the neurogenic pulmonary edema, uh, the stress cardiomyopathy, uh, all fall into uh, the possibilities of cardiac complications. This topic will be also explored uh, in your time during the neuro ICU. Uh, that's where you uh, get very much involved in the more continuous management of patients with subaortic hemorrhage. Delayed complications, not as early on as we most see our patients for uh, intervention of how to address the subaortic hemorrhage, um, but they also you, ma you also may be taking care of patients with delayed complications of subaortic hemorrhage, vasospasm, cerebral ischemia, and then also hydrocephalus need to be mentioned. So the complications of subaural hemorrhage is just as redundant as we like to be. Uh, you'll hear about this also during neuro ICU. The thing we worry about as perioperative physician, definitely the rebleed. Highest risk is in the first 72 hours after first symptoms. Our approach to it is like to secure as early as possible. Until you have an unsecured aneurysm, you want to keep your systolic blood pressure less than 140 millimeter of mercury. Time, uh, like the, the treatment of a rebleed, obviously supportive. The best bang for the buck is prevent the rebleed due to the high impact on morbidity and mortality um, by blood pressure control and getting this aneurysm secured. Early complications also we see are arrhythmias, uh, correct electrode abnormalities, and supportive. Um, it's related to your sympathetic stress. Uh, by securing the aneurysm and stabilizing the patient, that's how you address that. Stress cardiomyopathy, also the Takabushu cardiomyopathy, uh, relates also to the sympathetic tonus and sympathetic stress related to uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, can cause a significant decrease in left ventricular function. That's why every patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage should get a transthoracic echo. Uh, be prepared to uh, provide supportive care with inotropes and vasopressors. Nogenic pulmonary uh, edema also has been frequently seen in those patients. Uh, in uh, patients not going to the operating room or for intervention, obviously non-invasive ventilation with CPAP may be helpful, uh, but also when we do provide positive pressure ventilation, uh, we can uh, we counteract that with positive uh, end expiratory pressure PEEP. Uh, preload reduction within caution. Okay, so you don't want to create a hypovolemic patient. So maintain normal volemia, but do preload reduction. Uh, nit uh, nitrates also with caution, since it causes vasodilation in the cerebral blood, uh, uh, blood vessels. Uh, sometimes mild diuresis uh, can help, but again, you do this in communication with your uh, neurocritical care uh, person. Keep the patient normal volemic is of utmost importance. Electrolyte disturbances, uh, most importantly, hyponatremia, as we see it with SIADH or cerebral salt wasting. Um, the leader here, but also hypo kalemia and hypomagnesemia, all this contributes to your cardiac uh, complications as well. And you want to elect uh, correct those electrolytes. Uh, for sodium, the goal is uh, between 140 and 145, unless indicated differently by your neurocritical care team. Delayed complication, as uh, pointed out earlier, uh, vasospasm and hydrocephalus um, also need to be addressed and considered. So what are your treatment options for cerebral aneurysms? Interventional, 
a form for coiling uh, or open craniotomies uh, called clipping. The majority of aneurysms currently are addressed via endovascular approach. The reason is that uh, um, a large prospective randomized international multicenter study called ISTAT published uh, results uh, starting as early as 2002 showed that coiling had a lower death rate, a ballpark of 23.5%, and that was lower than the rate observed with clipping, which was more about like 31%. Also, the, um, uh, sorry, um, however, the rebleed rate at one year was seen higher in the coiling group, 2.6%, than the clipping group with 1%. Also, the five-year follow-up rate showed a difference in mortality, but here the coiling actually had a higher five-year mortality rate with 11% than with clipping, with only 14%. Actually, let me restate that. So the coiling 11% five-year mortality rate was lower than with clipping, the open approach with 14%. That's a rationale why you currently see more aneurysms addressed uh, interventionally than an open approach. However, there were significant criticisms to the ISTAT trial. From uh, the more than 9,000 patients screened, only 2,000 143 patients were recruited for that study. In the recruited patients, the majority of aneurysms were located in the anterior circulation. They were smaller, they were less than one centimeter in diameter. They only had uh, uh, WFNS grades of one to two, so a relatively low grade. And patients uh, older than 70 years old were excluded of the study. Cohort. As a consequence, there is a second trial ongoing. It started in 2012, and hopefully we will get results um, before uh, 2024. And here we're trying to address older patient population, more severe uh, subtral hemorrhage extent, and larger aneurysms in not only anterior circulation, but also middle and posterior circulation. And hopefully we'll get more answers towards what is the best approach, coiling versus clipping. We rarely see it in the operating room, but so let's go through a cerebral aneurysm clipping um, and what our anesthetic considerations are. Preoperatively, you need to know what your neurological deficit is, what's your extent, uh, ruptured versus unruptured in where your aneurysm is located. Uh, and you need to have that to have a, a reasonable and appropriate discussion with your surgical colleagues um, to uh, negotiate the best approach. Also assess your cardiovascular and pulmonary status. As described previously, there may be significant uh, fluctuations in uh, uh, impairments uh, functional impairments in uh, both areas not irrelevant for your perioperative care. Interoperatively, your focus should be on avoiding re-bleed and any alteration of cerebral blood flow because it may promote cerebral ischemia. Since you're working on a major uh, intracranial blood vessel, also be prepared for significant blood loss. For sure, you need to monitor blood pressure invasively. Uh, most of us would consider placing a pre-induction A-line standard of care. The procedure will be performed with general anesthesia and endotracheal intubation. Your surgeon will ask you for brain relaxation, since after dural monitoring, they have to expose uh, a brain vessel. Um, so therefore, most likely, you may have to give mannitol prior to dura opening. 
but you don't want to be too aggressive or too fast um, with uh, that change because any change in intracerebral pressure um, uh, has an effect on your transmural pressure of your aneurysm. So avoid any kind of rapid fluctuations in ICP. You know, if it drops too fast, then you're actually increasing your transmural pressure and therefore creating tension and promote rupture. Also, since uh, uh, we may cause states of low flow, uh, patients will need a mild form of anticoagulation with IV heparin prior to clip placement, made transient or permanent clip placement. So in our next uh, video, like here, I have courtesy of YouTube, here we're going through the stages of an intracranial aneurysm uh, uh, clipping. Identification of the pica branch leading into the aneurysm and the distal pica. This is the permanent clip being applied at the neck of the aneurysm with the intention to preserve the patency of the pica branch. One of the considerations of endovascular therapy being uh, dissecting aneurysm. So a suboccipital Okay, so now at least like you have seen how uh, this surgery um, is performed. For uh, the considerations, like in there, there are certain situations you need to be aware of when you take care of patients uh, during, uh, during uh, clipping. Uh, so you saw the placement of a permanent uh, clip and uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the importance of maintaining circulation afterwards. Sometimes when um, an aneurysm is not nicely configured, doesn't have a good broad placement, um, and a surgeon needs to uh, um, identify really the feeding vessel, um, they may decide to place a temporary clip. And it facilitates the placement of the permanent clip. Um, anytime you place a clip like this will reduce the blood flow and our job is to make sure that brain circulation is not compromised. So you need to have a form of neuromonitoring. monitoring. There can be EEG, there can be evoked potential, um, but since your patient is asleep, you need to have that to uh, um, have data for neurofunctionality. Uh, some Surgical advancement, actually, uh, they come up with a hybrid where they also have uh, some form of radio imaging present where you can inject a contrast, a marker, and then while they, were do while they are doing the surgery, they can uh, monitor several 
perfusion using fluorescence and so therefore mark brain circulation and therefore document um, the integrity of brain circulation. So all this will be done uh, while we are considering clip placement. But for temporary placement and also for permanent, you need to be able to really monitor your um, uh, cerebral circulation and that it is expressed by uh, perfusion pressures and also MAP. So make sure you control your blood pressure. Be able to uh, manipulate up or down uh, for the transient or for temporary clip placement. They may ask you to have controlled hypotension for the range of how low can the uh, lower limit go. That's what you use your neural monitoring for. You can drop your uh, blood pressures by either deepening the anesthesia uh, bolus or just increasing your anesthetic depth, uh, but also raising up the head, also that decreases your perfusion pressures, or you can give uh, adenosine or esmolol to also short acting um, uh, cardiovascularly drop your perfusion pressures. Really, um, hypothermic circulatory arrest uh, has been used for uh, neuroprotection during those situations. That really comes to play for basal artery aneurysm. Uh, they're directly over the brain stem, so therefore they are high risk um, for uh, brain under perfusion in then really essential centers. Um, but that's a possibility, and therefore you need a lot of advanced not only access, monitoring, and pharmacology. Another um, situation which can arise during aneurysm clipping is the accidental rupture during clipping. This could be a fatal event. So uh, that is the uh, really uh, super mega event uh, where everybody will be panicked, including your surgeon. So first priority is to get, to assist the surgeon to visualize rupture site and to stop the bleeding. Okay, so that means perfusion pressure is down. Okay, you have to negotiate the limits of the of hypotension and surely the duration, but uh, you're not going to go anywhere unless hemostasis is performed. So you need the surgeon to stop the bleeding, most likely with a temporary clip. Induced hypertension, either bolus propofol or atomidate. MAP will be requested of less than 50. Um, also, you can use IV adenosine as a fast fix. If there's anterior, uh, if the aneurysm is in the anterior circulation, uh, manually uh, applying pressures to both carotids underneath the drape also can help. For post op care, of uh, um, patients after aneurysm clipping. Yes, they're going most likely to the ICU intubated, but we're thriving for early emergence from anesthesia in a controlled setting, therefore you bring to the ICU, uh, but they should wake up as early as possible to allow neurological evaluation. So therefore avoid long acting pharmacological agents like uh, hydromorphone or um, uh, you know, benzodiazepines. Moving on to a different uh, craniotomy setting um, is for uh, arterial venous malformations. Most commonly, uh, those uh, vascular abnormalities are addressed in a hybrid approach. First, they're going to uh, an endovascular setting for embolization of your vascular malformation. Then they come to the operating room for surgical resections. AVM outside of uh, subnormal hemorrhages are the uh, most other common cause for intracerebral hemorrhages. Symptoms are usually headache, seizures and or seizures. And your patient cohort is usually between 10 to 30 years old, also presenting with intracerebral hemorrhage. For addressing those patients, uh, there are obviously a lot of risks for um, uh, addressing those vascular malformations. Um, when you take care of those patients in the IR suite for embolization, uh, sometimes that material we use for the embolization 
uh, does not only go to the arterial vascular malformation, so also um, goes to other cerebral regions, causing therefore cerebral ischemia, depending on the fetus and how well you have control over blood flow. Um, it also can embolize to systemic and pulmonary circulation, so therefore causing embolization uh, there as well. If you take care of this patient in the operating room for AVM resection, in addition to taking care of a patient for craniotomy, you need to prepare for massive, significant blood loss. So good IV access is mandatory. Also be prepared for brain relaxation to allow your surgeon good access to the um, vascular malformation, mannitol, and hyperventilation. Uh, we should utilize uh, TIVA as anesthetic technique to avoid cerebral blood flow uh, fluctuations uh, due to uh, volatile anesthetics. And for the vascular component, avoid hypertension during emergence. It increases your V-bleed risk. Uh, Short-acting or long-acting uh, beta blocker, esmolol, labetalol, um, in combination with obviously the vascular activity of labetalol, are preferred in those patients, depending on what stage you are in your emergence, but be prepared to counteract your blood pressure. Uh, Dexmatomidine as an alpha-2 agonist also can help with emergence and smoothening that process. If you do need uh, more um, uh, vascular active medications for blood pressure control, blood type readability, nicardipine as a calcium channel blocker is our preferred agent as a continuous infusion. Last not least, which other uh, cardiovascular disease to uh, consider? Uh, more chronic cardiovascular disease with a more diffuse picture as we see it with Moya Moya. Um, but also um, there are other uh, atherosclerotic diseases um, which we see patients in the operating room. Moya Moya as a chronic but rare cardiovascular disease affects children and adults. It leads to stroke, TIAs, severe headaches, seizures, um, transient or uh, permanent neurological impairment. Um, so a significant disease. And we see those patients in the operating room for either direct revascularization or indirect revascularization or a combination of such. So there can be the superficial temporal artery to MCA bypass, STA MCA bypass, or and please don't make me pronounce this uh, word, but EDAS, encephalodural synangiosis. Yeah, I've done it. Uh, which can be done as a single procedure or in combination with your um, STA to MCA bypass. So we, what we do here, if it's direct, kind of like you basically take your um, artery and you um, revascularize um, uh, that area which has been not perfused by your uh, stenotic um, uh, cerebral vascular disease affected blood vessels. The EDS, uh, EDS um, adds to it that here we also create a vascular connection to the dura itself as a very diffuse opening but you promote angiogenesis. While this may take, take several months to develop an adequate collateral flow, it's less prone to re the nose. So, um, when we take care of those patients in the operating room for anesthesia management, it's really important to remember we need to aggressively hydrate those patients, even starting in the preoperative period. You know, the NPO interval really should have kept as short as possible, allow those patients to drink. You do not want them to show up uh, dehydrated operating room, it really affects their vasotone and therefore your brain circulation. It's a vascular procedure, so we uh, will use anticoagulation in uh, the pay-operative management of those patients. Uh, heparin is used most commonly. They may be receiving low molecular um, anticoagulants up in front. 
um, you may have to give heparin interoperatively and not only heparin afterwards but in the postoperative period also start aspirin as early as possible. In the perioperative period, avoid increases in intracranial pressure. Uh, that the brain is at risk for brain edema, but you want to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. Assume that the ischemic areas, the diffuse ischemic areas of the brain, has lost its ability to autoregulate, so therefore it's very vulnerable to both extremes of blood pressure and cranial perfusion pressure. Uh, fluctuations. For sure you need to avoid hypotension. Okay. If at doubt you want to keep the perf uh, cranial perfusion pressure, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure, um, at a higher range. That's something you need to discuss with your neurosurgeon uh, where they want to set the limit. The optimal hematocrit also is debatable. It's probably not 30. But the optimum hematocrit uh, probably is higher than 21 because it's not only um, uh, the oxygen carrying capacity, uh, your cerebral oxygen delivery, but also blood viscosity, which uh, is uh, described by hematocrit. So avoid polycythemia. That's you know where the uvolemia comes in. Uh, but you also want to maintain an optimal cerebral oxygen delivery. Uh, Depending on uh, the overall comorbidities and compromise due to your cerebral vascular disease, your surgeon may ask you for neuroprotection, which induced burst suppression during critical portions of your vascular procedure. Uh, so be prepared for providing um, burst suppression with automated propofol um, in some further form of neuroprotection by mild hypothermia. In the post op period, obviously we are concerned about cerebral perfusion, um, cerebral hyperemia, hyperperfusion, which can lead to cerebral edema um, or intracranial bleeding. You want to avoid hypercapnia, so don't over sedate, but you want to maintain adequate cerebral perfusion pressures for this collateral blood flow you created to work. So uh, most commonly we are asked to keep the perfusion pressures um, at a higher range with minute blood pressures above 80 and definitely also maintain your patient well hydrated. Now really last not least, special circumstances the wake craniotomy. Initially starting more out for um, surgeries for uh, epilepsy and focus uh, uh, location. Now the indications for awake craniotomy have brought it out to tumor resection, addressing an excision of vascular malformations, uh, still like for um, identifying and resecting uh, epileptic foci and deep brain stimulation as we are placing for Parkinson's or obsessive compulsive disorders. So the indication for when a neurosurgeon may ask you to keep your patient awake to doing uh, certain, certain stages of uh, your craniotomy is broadening. However, uh, there are absolute and uh, relative contraindications to an awake craniotomy. Absolute, obviously, is the uncooperative patient or if a patient refuses. Uh, the refusal or uncooperation may be due to severe anxiety or a patient who is confused or just unable to lay flat for a prolonged period of time. Also, absolute uh, contraindication would be a patient who is unable to communicate with the provider due to either aphasia or as a language barrier. More or less relative contraindications, uh, they are you know, based on pre-existing comorbidities. Obesity as a part of where um, uh, your airway uh, may be compromised, 
pregnancy, history of difficult airways, so therefore we cannot secure an airway when we need to, uh, a patient who has chronic cough, so therefore um, may move at inappropriate times of that surgery, um, significant lung disease as it is COPD, hypercapnia, or obstructive sleep apnea. All these may make it difficult to provide optimal uh, conditions for um, uh, craniotomy. The way craniotomy, craniotomy um, is described as going through three, three stages, and we have to keep that in mind because it's not one size fits all. The initial stage, which is the exposing the brain, is probably the most stimulating part of that surgery, the surgical incision and then brain exposure. The second stage, that's the resection stage and which requires um, a cooperative and then awake patient because here is where we identify what we can take out, what we have to map, and then what we can resect. Um, obviously, during that part, the patient needs to demonstrate the functions are maintained, either verbal or through movement. And then the final stage is when we make sure the resection uh, that we have good control over bleeding, uh, have obtained hemostasis, and then close. So based on those three stages, that actually um, is how we have to think about the awake chronology. It either can be done patient asleep because there is no benefit during the exposing decision part of having a awake patient. So here, either with uh, uh, endotracheal tube or LMA, like keep asleep, then the second stage, that's where we need our patient awake. And then the last step, actually this is negotiable and really depends on your institution, um, how fast and how, uh, um, uh, you know, position obviously, if a patient can go back off to sleep or, or can stay awake uh, or with MAC, under MAC, um, during the closure stage. So asleep, awake, asleep, the SAS, or asleep, awake, awake, SAA. So our approach during awake craniotomy, um, really we have this. This is where we have to think about cooperation and communication. It's a multidisciplinary approach. We really have to plan and communicate each of our needs and how we can compromise. Surgeon, neurophysiologists, and anesthesiologists really need to map, you know, our plan. What do we do when, and uh, how to allow everybody to get the patient safely through this? We should do this up front, and then um, uh, execute based on that plan. We need to discuss positioning, our approach to airway management, and how the neurological functions are monitored. Patient may be pinned in Mayfield. You know, that really means kind of like you know, head movement must be avoided because it can cause significant damage to uh, your temporal sides and uh, blood flow. We should have plenty of airway equipment at hand from LMA, GlideScope to fiber optic um, to have several venues how we can secure an airway when it needs to be secured. And a neuro neurophysiologist and surgeon should also uh, be aware of how we will communicate if we feel like a patient has lost airway and we need to secure that. At all stages, even when a patient is awake, we should be able to monitor your partial pressure of uh, CO2 um, because obviously we need to uh, monitor ventilation and prevent hypoventilation, hypercapnia. Hypoventilation, hypercapnia. Propofol, remifentanil, due to short duration and tight availability, um, are very much gold standard for this procedure. Plus minus dexmatomidine, uh, patient has to be cooperative, but it does not need to be uh, fully awake. Uh, especially during the first stage, when we uh, secure an airway with endotracheal tube, we 
can use muscle relaxation. Now with the Gamadex, obviously, we also can fully reverse it. Uh, so while we provide muscle relaxation, we also need to be able to um, uh, antagonize that immediately to allow a patient full control over protective reflexes. But during the awake portion of um, the awake craniotomy, there still needs to be analgesia. And here now, this is regional anesthesia, scalp blocks. We have to block seven nerves, which can be done in a combined injection as a more field block. But the, blocks, uh, the nerves we address are the supraorbital nerve, the supracochlear nerve, the zygomatico temporal nerve, the auriculotemporal nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, the greater occipital nerve, and the greater auricular nerve. Okay, that gives you whole control over your, um, uh, your whole scalp. The supraorbital, supertrochlica, zygomatico temporal nerve, they're all branches, uh, and the auricular temporal nerve, they're all branches of the tri trigeminal nerve while the uh, lesser and greater occipital nerve and greater auricular nerve come from the either C2 or C3 root um, and um, also are addressed at here shown in those graphs. That brings me to the conclusion of this talk. So uh, thank you for your attention. Please feel free to uh, contact me for any questions and I want to conclude here with Oprah Winfield. Be thankful for what you have, okay, because it means you get more. Um, if you celebrate what you don't have, then you will never ever have enough. So thank you, and I hope that's the way how you can approach life. Thank you for your attention, and uh, hope to talk to you soon.